Finals SAQ 56, Fractured Neck of Femur A 90-year-old woman sustains a fractured neck of femur following a fall. She is scheduled for surgery. A. What aspects of this patient's care will have the greatest impact on outcome? Number 1. Multidisciplinary care with a hip fracture program to include rapid optimization of correctable conditions for surgery such as anemia, anticoagulation, volume depletion, electrolyte imbalance, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled heart failure, correctable arrhythmias or ischemia, acute chest infection, and exacerbation of chronic chest conditions. Orthogeriatrician input, individualized rehabilitation goals, and liaison with related services such as mental health, falls prevention, primary care and social services. Secondly, surgery on planned trauma list on the day of or day after admission, team to include senior anesthetist and surgeon. Number three, surgical approach. Total hip replacement rather than hemiarthroplasty for displaced intracapsular fracture if the patient is previously fit, active, and cognitively intact. Extramedullary implant for trochanteric fracture above and including the lesser trochanter. This is cheaper and less likely to be involved in periprostatic fracture than intramedullary implant. Intramedullary nail for subtrochanteric fracture. Number four, rehabilitation daily to start no later than the day after surgery and to continue after hospital discharge. B. Outline the recommendations made by the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence 2011 for the management of acute pain in this patient. Firstly, assess pain immediately on admission, 30 minutes after analgesia is given, hourly until settled on the ward, and as part of routine observations thereafter. Analgesia to be given immediately on admission with suspected hip fracture, even if cognitively impaired. Pain control should be adequate to allow for investigations. Stepwise multimodal analgesia, paracetamol 6 hourly unless contraindicated, opioids as necessary, nerve block such as fascia iliaca block, NSAIDs not recommended. C. What causes of a fall in this patient might impact on the anesthetic management? Respiratory. Possible causes of a fall includes exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and pneumonia. Regional anesthesia may be preferable to avoid interference with lung mechanics. CVS causes includes bradyarrhythmias, or tachyarrhythmias, myocardial infarction, valvular heart disease such as aortic stenosis, structural abnormalities such as HOCM, higher levels of monitoring such as invasive BP and cardiac output monitoring may be employed in the presence of significant comorbidities, neuraxial techniques relatively contraindicated in left ventricular outflow limiting disease. Neurological causes include stroke, peripheral neuropathy, dementia and Parkinson's, Confusion or other difficulty with positioning may cause problems complying with neuraxial approach. Pre-existing neuropathy should be documented prior to any form of anesthesia. Possible endocrine causes of a fall includes diabetes mellitus, leading to hypoglycemia, and diabetic ketoacidosis. Awake surgery would permit ongoing neurological monitoring once fit for surgery. Pharmacological causes of a fall includes polypharmacy, leading to hypotension, bradycardia, and electrolyte imbalances. More invasive monitoring and adjusted drug doses may be required. Infective causes of a fall include sepsis due to confusion and hypoxia. Sepsis may contraindicate neuraxial technique. Arthritic conditions can cause pain and deformity, which can lead to a fall. Arthritic conditions may cause difficulty with positioning for regional or neuraxial techniques. Chairman's report. 52.9% pass rate. Significant number of candidates gave a generic answer without relating to NICE guidelines. A significant number of candidates in Section B failed to concentrate on the management of pain and digressed to general aspects of care. Additional information. Anesthesia for femoral neck fracture. Surgical procedures for fractured neck or femur may involve cannulated screws, Richard screw and plate, dynamic hip screw, dynamic compression screw, total hip replacement and intramedullary nail, with operation duration ranging from 20 to 90 minutes, 
pain from moderate to severe. Position is supine for most procedures except for total hip replacement, which is in lateral position. Blood loss may range from nil to one liter. Practical techniques include spontaneous ventilation with LMA and regional block, spinal or CSE with or without sedation, or general anesthesia with endotracheal tube intubation and IPPV. Hip fractures are common, 67,000 per annum in the 2020 National Hip Fracture Database report, 80% female, average age 84 years old, 80% occurs in more than 75 year olds. In Western society, lifetime risk is 18% for women, 6% for men. 3-month mortality is 12%, increasing to 21% at 1 year. Preoperative Physiological reserve is reduced and comorbidity is common. Resuscitation should start as soon as the patient is admitted to hospital. Thorough pre-op assessment and surgery to be scheduled during the earliest possible daytime session. Patient should be risk-assessed prior to surgery, for example, with Nottingham hip fracture score, frailty score and 480 delirium score. Surgical treatment can be either fracture fixation or femoral head replacement. Depending on nature of fracture, surgical preference, previous mobility and life expectancy. Cannulated hip screws are quick, largely non-invasive procedures with a small incision and little blood loss. Cemented or uncemented hemiarthroplasty is a longer procedure, similar to the femoral part of a primary hip replacement. Dynamic hip screw or Richards screw and plate are intermediate procedures. Any decisions to delay surgery should be based on a realistic attempt to improve the patient's medical condition rather than a fruitless pursuit of normal values. A mild chest infection is unlikely to improve in a bed-bound elderly, whereas frank pneumonia with sepsis and dyspnea may respond to rehydration, antibiotics, and chest physiotherapy. Surgery should not be delayed pending echocardiography for suspected valvular disease. Hip fracture surgery should take place within 36 hours of sustaining a fracture. Many patients will be taking anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy. Based on the ESRA guidelines 2022, management in neuraxial and deep nerve blocks and management in low-risk bleeding blocks such as superficial nerve blocks in patients taking anticoagulants or antiplatelets are included here for completion. Good communication between the surgeons, orthogeriatricians, and anesthetists is important. There should be a daily multidisciplinary team discussion of each patient scheduled for surgery. Dehydration is common as oral intake is often much reduced. IV fluids must be commenced as soon as the patient is admitted to hospital. Analgesia should be commenced as often the patient is in considerable pain. Fascia iliaca block in ED can provide dynamic analgesia and reduces opioid requirements. Perioperative for fracture fixation, the patient is usually positioned supine on a hip table. This involves a placement of a groin prop with the table supporting the upper body only. Feet are tied to the shoe supports and the table is then elevated to allow for radiographic screening. For hemiarthroplasty, the patient is lateral or supine on an ordinary operating table. Blood loss is variable. Much of the measured blood loss is old hematoma, but significant hemorrhage can occur which may necessitate transfusion. Transfusion trigger is controversial, but should be 9 grams per deciliter. Choice of anesthetic technique. Regional anesthesia and GA are both advocated, but recent emphasis is on maintenance of physiological stability, particularly blood pressure. Combined spinal epidural anesthesia has a significant advantage by enabling the use of low-dose intratical local anesthetic which reduces the risk of hypotension, with knowledge that the epidural catheter may be used to extend the block if necessary, and CSE also avoids the risk of general anesthesia. Peripheral nerve blocks should be used routinely to supplement GA or spinal anesthesia when indicated. Sedation may be necessary, but any sedative can produce unpredictable effects in the elderly and should only be used when necessary. Check pressure points after placement on the hip table, as these patients are prone to pressure damage. Use some form of passive or active warming device to prevent hypothermia. Bone cement implantation syndrome is a problem with hip fracture. Kindly refer to Finals SAQ42 for further info.
take care to avoid intraop hypotension. Postoperative, pain is often only due to the incision, which is small for cannulated screws and dynamic hip screw, but larger for hemiarthroplasty, although DHS procedures may cause a considerable amount of post-op pain. Fracture pain will be reduced but is still present on rolling and turning in bed. Post-op analgesia can be provided by regular IV paracetamol or epidural analgesia. Opioids should be used sparingly. Most patients will require some post-op analgesia, although some do not. Take care with NSAIDs due to the risk of GI bleeding and renal complications. Some patients may require a period of monitoring in the PAKU, HDU or ICU. Special considerations. In high-risk patients, procedures can be undertaken with local anesthesia alone. Morbidity and mortality risk should be understood by the patients and relatives. In some patients, the resuscitation status should be reviewed. A useful resource for all anesthetists involved in the management of hip fracture patients is the NHS Hip Fracture Perioperative Network. Thank you.